Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piskor. Going to do a mailbag episode today, Ed. Kind of a, an interesting cross-section of things have, have arrived at the Cartoonist Kayfabe compound. But before we start going through that, let's see Red Room. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in the Red Room universe, man. Uh, each issue completely self-contained and probably two issues out right now as of this video going live with the potential for three being out there. Um, each issue completely self-contained. Uh, if you see an issue, grab an issue. It tells a complete story. Get them put on your pull list uh, at your local comic shop. Or if you don't have a good comic shop nearby, pre-order that stuff and order that stuff through Fantagraphics website. If you want to read the comics ahead of time, hit up my Patreon. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. Three bucks gets you the archive there. And uh, there are well over uh, four issues of material up there right now. More than 100 pages worth of stuff. All for three bucks. Uh, new strips every Tuesday. You can join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, where you can download my out-of-print zines and mini-comics. I have a dozen of those available for patrons. Uh, the first, or the most recent upload is the Street Angel Gang Process Zines. It's two parts. I reproduce my script, showing all of my layouts that I draw directly on the scripts themselves. And then the pencil roughs, uh, maybe a cross between pencil roughs and the actual pencils. Um, I also have wrestling zine of all of my drawings of various wrestlers. Uh, ballpoint pen notebook zines, and uh, many, many more. I post a lot of original art and basically the comics that I make and how I make them. So patreon.com slash jimrug is where you can find all of that. Let's begin here, Ed. Last gasp, uh, recent publications. Yes. So this is Slow Death Zero, came out in 2020, and uh, a square bound, kind of a big issue. I think they're presenting this as a bit... It's the last Slow Death issue, at least the last one that they have planned for now. Drew Friedman doing Ron Turner, the publisher of Last Gas. Uncle Ron. Looks pretty cool. Um, you can see the table of contents there. It's a wide variety of cartoonists that are featured in here, from R. Crumb to Mike Diana, and a lot of people in between, including Greg Irons, a reprint of an old, uh, the late Greg Irons piece. Uh, William Stout, Brian Talbot, just a huge list. Shouts to K. Faber Skinner out there in the wild, man. Uh, we have a little bit of an intro from John B. Cook talking about how this issue came together, but more importantly, the uh, a little history about Slow Death, which is kind of cool. I always like having this sort of extra material. Little Rory Hayes cameo appearance. Yeah, I mean, all of these underground, you know, masterpiece kind of comics. How it grew out of, like, fandom of EC comics. Really uh, interesting stuff. And beautiful to see some of these publications. The skull covers. Slow Death, it's like uh, the ecological comic, right? Like First like... issue was produced on Earth Day. Uh, like the original Earth Day. And I think that there was some organization that like funded it. And the uh, people in charge of that organization turned over while Slow Death was being made. So whenever they finished it up, it was a new regime that wasn't as interested. And they're like, yeah, I guess we'll take 10 copies. And they had tens of thousands of copies then on their hands. <laughs> and uh, that's how you start becoming a distributor, I suppose. But uh, one of the noteworthy pieces is Richard Corbin's story is in this. This might be the last Richard Corbin story. Yeah, that's, that's certainly one, one, of, one of the last ones. So... Kind of noteworthy for that, but, you know, 150 pages of, uh, of, of underground comics and, and interesting cartoonists throughout this thing. So pretty nice, pretty nice uh, volume and new. Came out in 2020 during uh, while we were all locked down. Yeah, man. I think these the pieces uh, came from, from John B. Cook and uh, the oral history of Weirdo Magazine, right? Like, fantastic. If you go on a cover real quick, dude, I think that's Mark Zingarelli. Painted by uh, painted by Drew Friedman. Young Mark Zingarelli. Yeah, weirdo era yeah. Mark Zingarelli. Good call. Uh, Dan Klaus. Oh, for sure, man. I mean, I just saw Robert Williams on there. I love this shit. Uh, got the mug shots of everybody involved. And this is important, man, because like, you see Leonardo DiCaprio. Like, George DiCaprio is, is a dude that was juiced in with the underground for, for years and years. Like, Jay Lynch would, would tell me about him and stuff, and he's in the Zukalski documentary, like, one of the guys that kind of, like, yeah. with Glenn Bray, like, unearthed uh, uh, that Zukalski character. And this is uh, this is what you want. I only gave it a quick glance right now, and I think that we're going to have to do a bigger version. Absolutely. Uh, at some point, but the questions that you have, like, are answered. It gives you a good shot of the landscape of, like, where underground comics was at which is to say 
they were nowhere. Like this is like the last vestige uh, of that man. Like when there's like there's like the uh, the splinter cells. Like it's like you have raw or you have weirdo man. And that was like that was it. You know you want to answer questions like. Who the heck is this Pete Bag kid who just came from SVA and gets to be the editor right after Robert Crumb? Like, how does that happen? We need we need those uh, questions answered, and uh, you're gonna get it from the horse's mouth, like in within these pages. Pretty freaking cool. Yeah, really great. Uh, and a substantial book. This is a big hardcover book. Uh, you know, 250 pages and just lots of art, lots of uh, cartoonists talking. Like, we were looking at those end pages. I love seeing photographs of all these cartoonists. Everybody that I, I only know their signatures in their, in their comics. Always cool to see that. And... Uh, this is a nice book about comics and specifically about weirdo. Yeah, yeah, it's it's almost has like the format of uh, John B. Cook's comic book artist magazine, and I wonder if maybe if it started that way and it just got so sort of ahead of itself, and there was so much information to call down that it was like, nah, dude, we got to just these make covers a big are ass book. just masterpieces. Like all the weirdo covers, absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, so. Cr Crumb is shooting for the fences for sure. Some weirdo mini comic. <laughs> I even like that logo. Yeah, it's a nice book and uh, a lot of talent in those pages, man. Like, holy cow. All right. Uh, comic Book Rebels. This is something we came across, Ed, in a, in a wizard, I think, or yeah. possibly an early comics journal. And it was like, what is this book? Because it sounds so cool. Conversations with creators. And then you see, like, who's in here. Uh, Steve Bissett, by the way, one of the co-creators of this book, along with Stanley Waiter, Wyater, I don't, I'm not familiar with him, but of course, Steve Bissett, we, you know, we know we have a nice big interview with him, admire lots of his comics, but the list of people in here, Scott McCloud, Larry Martyr, Jack Jackson, Richard Corbin, um, it's quite a list. It, it's really phenomenal. Eastman and Laird, Dave Sim, Dennis Kitchen, Mobius, Alan Moore. It's phenomenal. And ending with like Todd McFarlane with a, with a big piece in here, Frank Miller. So kind of a phenomenal book in that it's set 93 is when this is published so it's it's you know image has come out and it's really positioned as if like there's a new paradigm yeah and marvel and dc you know they're basically welcome to the front lines of war <laughs> and you know it's it's looking at it through this idea of creator ownership and what this new generation of comics cartoonists are doing and looking for you know being able to make the comics they want to make and how they do it and it gets into stuff like i mentioned larry martyr uh who was he publisher of image for a time period he worked on the image staff um, yeah. early in their in their career but after this book but he's a guy that has a lot of experience in the distribution side of the business and so like they get into that you know into self-publishing into distribution and pretty much into challenging that marvel dc paradigm of uh you know corporate ownership no longer that's kind of what this book is is uh a lot of change in the comics air at this time and really going to some of the practitioners of that to uh you know see their perspectives on it and scott mcleod's uh the intros for like each person are phenomenal but this is right when understanding comics comes out and it's really interesting to see like scott mcleod's history up to that point where he's inventing card games that have to do with comic panels uh called called uh, five card nancy he has 24-hour comics here. First thing that's written is the Bill of Rights for Comics Creators. Obviously, understanding comics is you know almost instantly a classic whenever it's published, so they talk about that. But mini comics destroy, and uh, it's just every single person in here gets this kind of treatment where you get to see why are they in here, why do we know them, and then get into the interviews. So pretty good with a, uh, a wide range of characters. I haven't read all of them yet, but man, talk about compelling reading at night. What if we show off uh, Maelstrom's, dude? Works for me. We each got copies of this, and uh, both noteworthy for the piece of artwork that was included with the mini comic. This is Anthony Vaccarelli, and I didn't find any um, social media stuff on the book, so that's the name that I'm going to point to. But this is an impressive work. Yes. And uh, not just the fan art that he sent, although that's I like the black and white really nice. Um, love the color. Give it a glance through. Yeah, definitely. So... Take a close look at this guy's stuff. It is extremely detailed, very intense kind of work, and a substantial book. This is a thicker-than-normal kind of self-published zine mini-comic, and it's just wild. Uh, really impressive art. Somebody I'm not familiar with may have made a lot of mini-comics before this. I really don't know, but this one stands out as being 
pretty impressive. Yeah. You come across this somewhere, you're going to be ha- your eyes are going to thank you for it. So, Anthony Vicarelli, thank you, and uh, that's probably the the place to start looking if you would like to get a copy of Maelstrom for yourself. A couple of uh, honest to god mini comics here, Ed, and uh, this is another one I didn't find any any uh, contact information, but Andrew Gutierrez. Gutierrez. Gutierrez, that sounds much better. And this is like a fight comic. So I might have these out of order. This main character is basically entering a big time fight, uh, like a death fight. Uh, What's her name? Uh, Cynthia Rothrock will play her in the movie. Exactly. Man, that's a good pull. Perfect. (laughs) (laughs) I will avenge you. She puts on makeup to get into into the fight with these two. I like this because you see lots of mini comics and they're usually, um, I don't know, they're, it's a cartoonier kind of format usually. This feels like uh, you know an image comic kind of action Mortal Kombat type of application for the mini comic. You just don't see that too often, and they're double stabbings. <laughs> Want to check the Will, new Will Sweeney? I'm so excited to see this. So I'm a fan of Will Sweeney, a UK cartoonist. He makes videos, illustrator, all this stuff. And I knew that, uh, I had heard that Fanographics published a new piece of his. So this is the first time I've seen it, Ed. Yeah, man. It's my first flip through. Good color. Great color. And it doesn't look like uh, a kind of comic that you could do a page of day. <laughs> no, pretty intense stuff. Yeah, I mean, this is everything that I like about Will Sweeney's on display here. Just a kind of inventive uh, visual artist. And uh, I'm always happy when he does a comic because I have a feeling he makes his money in other fields. I think I think video art may pay more than uh, than typical comic book art. But this looks really cool. And I think this is new. I think yes. this is uh, pretty fresh. Yeah. So wherever you get Fanographics books, you could track this one down. Cool format too, right? Like in a in a world that's... You're run by graphic novels and stuff with spines, like shout Safanta for putting out periodicals, man. Yeah, zigzag. Very cool. Um, although the kind of format that you're not going to find too many mint condition copies of this book in in six months. I mean, this thing is already <laughs> beat up and I just got it. Back channel, Matt Belisle. This is a, another mini comic, but I thought it was an interesting format, and I think it looks really good. Yeah. And I think this guy is uh, pretty new to comics, if I understand this correctly, and I do get notes and stuff. They end up pretty chaotic by the time I have these boxed and unboxed and stuff. Uh, but I thought it stood out as being a really well-done comic, and again, with the interesting format, probably like 11 by 17 paper, you do it two up and then just cut it cut it in half lengthwise. And... Uh, really plays with that horizontal landscape. This is like your widescreen comics filtered through mini comics as a format. How about this bound version of Warlock 5, man? Uh, First 13 issues, all the the Dennis B uh, issues of art. This is uh, this is one we had to flip for. This is really (laughs) nicely. I think it may be hand bound, but it's really tight. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if, like, he trimmed or something. It's so well done. But Warlock 5, I think we've kind of glanced at in past episodes, maybe, uh, you know, 50-cent comic episodes. This guy, I, I love this comic. Super of the 80s. And uh, it's nice that he does the bound edition because then you get these gorgeous covers. Yes, yes. One of the one of the great uh, outlaw comics to come from Air Cell. You know, they put a lot of stuff out, but not all that stuff looked like this. No, that's some badass stuff. Maybe we'll look at one one or two more of these covers just because uh, I'd like to show him off. It's also the most of the 80s. It sure. feels like he just took whatever the five highest grossing like <laughs> action movies and, and big, big hit movies of the 80s were and pulled all kind of stuff. You know, Terminator, So what aliens. are you saying this is from, man? Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street? Well, this one might be original. <laughs> It's beautiful stuff, though, and he hasn't done that many comics. Did did some, an Alien series at Dark Horse, did an adaptation of Universal's Frankenstein at Dark Horse, a, a one-shot in color. So, you know, if you like this guy, and why wouldn't you, uh, you can track down a little bit more of his work. But that's a nice, that's, that's a good object. This one was pretty fun. We just opened this, I think, last week, maybe. Um, oh, did I lose my... My sheet on this guy. Oh, no, you know what? Did you get a double cover? Double cover. You know what they told me at Ides, man? When you're grading, when you're grading your uh, double cover <laughs> variants, 
It's the inside covers grade that is the one that you go by. <laughs> How'd that even come up? <laughs> because <laughs> that is a deep <laughs> conversation for odds. Yeah, somebody sent uh, one of their their eBay packages back uh, to to odds, and they were so uh, beside themselves that it came back in a worse condition. Not surprised, I suppose. Uh, part of what I like about this: these are dudes that self published. 30 years ago yeah and you know sending us their uh their issues so this is uh 1992 out of waco texas boy that'd be an interesting place to live in the early 90s huh? exact time <laughs> yeah but pretty good looking art and i guess the cover artist is uh is somebody that went on to work in comics uh in you know marvel dc comics john lucas but uh I love seeing this stuff. You know, it's kind of neat because like we get so much self-published comics from today, when which it, is cool. But it's awesome that it's like this has been going on. There's a tradition of this. One of the great uh, discoveries that that we made was uh, Steve McArdle, man. The Red Bullet. Red Bullet stuff. Like some some random person sent us uh, one or two. We highlighted it and really freaking adored it. And then Steve got in touch, sent us the whole uh, bibliography, man. Yeah, it's awesome that he's still kind of active, too. Um, still posting artwork. You can still find that stuff if you follow him. I think he's going to be working with the Power Comics guys. I'm looking forward to it. But, yeah, I, I love the history that, you know, like, these guys, people are watching that have been doing this stuff since uh, since long before we started. Uh, Gun Viking by Ewan. You can find, I guess, more info at Ewan, ewan.com. But this was another flipper for us where you guys send in one copy and you, you really threaten the team sometimes with this <laughs> stuff. Uh, but definitely pops off the page. As soon as we started flipping through this, it was like, yeah, we're going to have to uh, we're gonna have to flip the coin for it. Gun Viking. <laughs> it kind of says it all, right? Yeah, man, listen, that's a good mashup. Is this what they call Fusion Comics, Jim? Yeah, exactly, Fusion <laughs> Comics, head. This is what they call Outlaw Comics in color, oh, just so being cool. ripped to pieces. And it's kind of the Corbin palette, man, where you have oranges, purples... All on the same page. It's cartoony. It has some of that cartoony language, even though, you know, it has the big muscular super super uh, hero-like main character, but just getting in fights, some of them, you know, with monsters of the north <laughs> and always with the guns blazing. At one point, he gets his arms cut off. Look at that with the mini helicopter gun, a la Predator. <laughs> and after he unloads it on him, then he just jumps up and beats him with it. It's good looking stuff, very fun, and it's, you know, it's graphic now. It's like, I don't know, 150 pages of full color painted art, although it might be full digital for all I know, and a nice section in the back of some extras and odds and ends. We like Gun Viking. We're also fans of Man Ben, right? And this book came through The Office Man, the manga startup guide with uh, Mr. Nightow, the manga co created uh, Tri Gun. And this is very insightful into the process of the mangaka laying out all the tools that they like you know we have our how to draw comics the marvel way and we have our set of tools french curves worked into this illustration that's fun that's fun uh this this is a crash course like basically all the stuff you see in man ben like you're gonna see sort of broken down all the different kinds of nibs like they're not using speedball nibs right let's z it's zebra pens and g pens and stuff all the those kinds of pieces uh, and, you know, it's nuts and bolts, you know, how to make comics mm -hmm. the Mr. Nightow way. Yeah. Uh, love these kind of things where you see the process, you know, putting together your rough drafts, the underdrawing, the ad pen, and then outlining all of the tools that are used in here. See, that's an art installation right there, man. It's really fantastic. Tone work. Yeah, dude. Yeah, this is a good-looking book. There's so many of these manga books, too, like the how-tos, and I have no idea where to begin. I know there's some really good ones, right. and uh, I think this looks like one. It seems pretty thorough, showing, like, the, the name, Name. Yeah. Uh, but I always uh, like to see this kind of stuff. I mean, that is really sparse. Right, and then this is what it translates into. Yeah, you incredible. know, like like this means assistant get to work, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a such a basic shape for your building, and then you see it's like in perspective and clouds reflecting off Took the windows. Thirteen hours to do. I caught I caught sushi sushi with Mister Naito while, while I was out there, man. I I said I wanted to go to go to Jiro, and he was like, "Can't get you to Jiro, man. You gotta you gotta reserve your table like a year and a half in advance." But I know his homie. Like I know a dude like Jiro and this other sushi chef, they uh 
they came up through the same master and I was like, yeah, let's go. So, th so then we went and the presentation's all the same, just like in the um, documentary, it's like one piece at a time. Wow. And like, he tells you when to eat it. Like sometimes maybe sit for a couple of seconds. Uh, other times like put some wasabi, like he tells That's you how awesome. to do the whole bit. And then I was like, Mr. Nightel, how am I ever supposed to go back to freaking Pittsburgh <laughs> and, and get some, uh, some new dumpling house sushi ever again? And he said, oh, sometimes bad sushi is good sushi too. <laughs> He's right about that. He is. <laughs> There's a time and a place is what he said. No doubt about it. That's an amazing book, though. It'll be fun to, uh, I'll, I'll be curious to, to hear more about it, Ed, as you go through that book. We're going to do this in full. Okay. I, I decided. We'll, 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 we'll crack this open, man. I'm seeing a lot of people showing this off. And, dude, it's a new Langraf, right? Like, we, we got we to gotta give that shine. Sounds good. These are two publications from Floating World uh, Comics, a good retailer in Portland, but also a publisher. They've been publishing for, like, 10 years now. They're becoming the most exciting publisher in comics. <laughs> they publish some good stuff. So Shouts to Jason. Uh I'm all in favor of this. We'll give you one, one, one or two glimpses inside of here. But as Ed says, Ken Langriff, new Ken Langriff, always a reason to be excited. Worth a, worth a full video. And I, uh, I don't know, man, 48 pages or something like a hefty, a hefty volume there. And then Crime Destroyer. Outlaw Comics. <laughs> and uh, noteworthy because Shaky Kane is drawing this issue. And there is some weird stuff in here. It looks like the registration is off in this page, right? Or at least in this panel, until you look at the other panels and right. it's perfectly sharp and crisp. So some effects that uh, Shaky thing. Kane is putting in there. And this is part of uh, of um, the all-time comics line, which, you know, like Ben Mara worked on, Herb Trimpey. Langriff might have worked on those as well. I think so, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty interesting team of talent that has gone through the all-time <laughs> comic stuff. And... Uh, Add Shaky Kane's name to that list now. Makes perfect sense. So pretty fun superhero comics in color and, uh, you know, really pick up any of the all-time comics. I think I think Floating World's published most of them, if not all of them. I, I think Fantagraphics oh, did yeah, the first they did, round. They did a volume. Yeah, that's right. All right, Space Knights. This is a collected volume. Kevin Anthony Catalan. Oh, you know what? It may not be collected, actually. I, I might be confusing that with something else. And there is Kevin's information where you can follow him. It may just be, uh, you know, like volume number one, but a pretty impressive debut. I like this image a ton. We had we had some amazing stuff coming through. Beautiful color. Through the offices, man. And when you bust something like this out and the dude is like, <laughs> yeah, this is, page this, one. this is my first time. This is my first comic. It's mind-blowing. Like, like, the stuff that people can make... You know, it's it's one guy's putting this thing out. Incredible. I love the color on this. Beautiful. It's a fight comic. He does this really cool conceit where there are uh, several opponents that this character is going to fight, and each one starts with this kind of like painting pinup. And look at that guy, Beware Giants. Awesome. <laughs> and this is probably you know 100, 150 pages, something like that. But a square bound, you know, graphic novel like reading experience for uh, Space Knights. Samuel Hickson's Liquid Realm, One Man Anthology. This is very much in the tradition of, say, 8-Ball or, you know, Fanographics output in the late 80s, early 90s. And it's up there. It's hand-lettered. Uh, variety of different styles, as you can see just from that inside cover versus page one. And then several short stories are found in this that cover several different genres. So you'll have something that's a little bit more... I don't know what the word is for this, serious and rendered, but then you get something that's more cartoonish following it. And it's a classic comic book, you know, 24 pages, 32 pages, something like that. But uh, pretty good stuff from a young cartoonist, and you can follow him at Hickson Illustration on Fanographics, or on, on Instagram. Vacuum Decay. I don't have any contact information for this, but you can find, look up Vacuum Decay. This is an anthology of horror comics, and it's put together by Harry Nordlinger, but it's just, uh, it's horror comics. So, horror popular genre always, and this is a bunch of indie cartoonists, alternative cartoonists, mini comic cartoonists, web cartoonists, just a bunch of different cartoonists doing horror comics. And there are three volumes of this uh, to date, I believe. This is volumes two and three. Same kind of format, but uh, pretty interesting comics. And uh, I talked to Harry a little bit about this, but I see this one online a lot. 
Um, smart to do anthologies because then all your contributors are also promoting the book. So you end up seeing more, more ways for people to find the work. I spent one year, uh, maybe like 2003 or so, where all I tried to do was anthology work for that reason, right? Let me let me poach some of your fans. <laughs> That's pretty good looking stuff. So Vacuum Decay, you can find a lot more of this and you can find lots of this online. The Shout, makers. Shouts to our dudes up there in Nova Scotia. Absolutely. Dave Howlett. Uh, some of you longtime viewers may remember him as the guy who fulfilled my dream of the Electra Assassin poster by <laughs> Bill Sienkiewicz. Hangs on my wall now. Uh, but yeah, Strange Adventures, the comic shop that we visited uh, shortly before lockdown happened. But That's a beautiful true. comic shop and a great scene there north of the border. And The Makers is awesome. This is a story about this group in the early 90s. You see the dedication to the image guys. This is kind of like an image-like story of these creators who break out with their own characters and uh, their own comics go off on their own. And you can see the contrast between like set in the comics world, set in the, uh, in the real world with these creators. Pretty cool. I've actually seen a couple more issues of this as PDFs. So I think he's, he's making the print editions uh, slowly but surely. I don't know how he prints these, but they feel good. It feels like newsprint. That was something that we, we had conversations about that because he sent us some other comics that were printed on the same stuff. And it just... You know, like feels good. Canada does Qu color well. Yeah, like they, like they know how to print up there. No doubt. Uh, 1993, near and dear to my heart. So, this is a pretty fun comic, and it's a series. Uh, you can find Dave's work there at Paschetti Paschetti Western. Yes, on Instagram. So check him out. Uh, good, good guy, good cartoonist. And I, this is my favorite comic of his so far. Added this to my box of gimmicks: wrestling comics, <laughs> Sabu. <laughs> I, uh, I dig this kind of stuff. It's very raw. This is the creator, Chris Orenkinto. Orenkinto. Sorry, Chris, if I'm butchering that name. You can find more of his work on Instagram here. But uh, I love these kind of like raw wrestling comics. It feels like, you know, outlaw comics. It feels like bootleg comics. It feels like what I love about the black and white explosion type comics. And it's about Sabu, who's one of the most violent wrestlers of all time, which kind of lends itself well to a match with Terry Funk. Uh-oh, somebody's bicep's going to get ripped off and he's going to have to tape it back up. How great. Uh, love a Terry Funk comic. Can't believe he doesn't have a bunch of comics out there, but early days of EC there with these two uh, show, show, show down in a barbed wire match, and uh, you can see the violence being perpetrated throughout. Eight Men of the Apocalypse, issue five. There's definitely a collection of these available of like the first three issues. This is Brad Dwyer at Brad Dwyer underscore comics. What a good splash page. I love it, man. Dude, with, with uh, the mock duotone artwork. Yes. Very noteworthy. Yeah. And uh, five issues in. So a series that he's been building and uh, just this classic kind of fun comics. Again, in that vein of like the black and white comics that I love. They didn't end in the 80s. You know, this is new stuff. And the cool thing is, like, it, the the creators, the audience, just more sophisticated. So so I feel like uh, the Outlaw comics that are done now, they, they have more of a payoff. You know what I'm saying? They, they sort of, they uh, sort of fulfill the promises now. They, they really kind of do. Yeah, you're right about that. It's almost like a more concentrated, we've learned lessons from the past. Yes. And uh, we're getting right into people getting shot in the face <laughs> and punched through the chest. Uh, I love, you know, there's Kirby references. So pretty fun comics in that classic vein. If you like 80s black and white uh, explosion comics, I think you'll be happy to take a look at Eight Men of the Apocalypse. And Ed, I'm going to, this is the end of my stack for now, but one of the most interesting things that I've seen in a while just showed up. I'd never heard of this comics career newsletter, and this is number 21 from June, 1990. So obviously there's at least 20 other issues of this. I actually know there's quite a few more than that. And, uh, this reminds me of words and pictures. Whenever we were looking yeah. at that newsletter and it's like industry professionals kind of talking about their business, this is very similar. Uh, you know, it has things like innovation, publisher, you know, innovation and viz, both publishers <laughs> and what they're looking for. Um, <laughs> oh, this guy, man. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry for anybody who, who, uh, who, 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 uh, sent their submissions to that. <laughs> viz is mostly lettering stuff. Yeah. You know, that's what they I know, need. I know a and, lot of letters. So they outline some of that stuff, touching up artwork, 
uh, Wayne Truman, Stan Sakai, Leah Hernandez. So, you know, some of the, the people that are working for them now to give you an example of what they're looking for. Letters from Cat Ironwood and Dave Sim. Um, it's just, this is an interesting document to me. And part of the reason I'm interested in it is, Ed, I wanted to get into comics in 1990. Never heard of this thing until last week. It, it, this might be a um, dirt sheet or something. Whatever it is, like, you know, 22 issues of it at least. Uh, it's printed on, not newsprint, but this is web press printing. Like, he printed a thousand of these or more. Yeah. Uh, and, and apparently was sending them out to subscriptions, you know, and it's definitely aimed at people that would be starting to, you know, try to break in. So there's what do editors owe you in terms of feedbacks for the submissions that you send. Um, I think this is a clever ad. Let me show off some of my pages. I'm a, I'm a new cartoonist here, you know, starting to get my book published at Caliber, but I can still throw some of my pages in here to promote myself. And Kirk Crichton, Critton, the editor publisher, uh, I was digging to see what is available with this stuff. And it turns out um, he's collected a bunch of the interviews from this into a book that I guess was crowdfunded maybe, but is available. So you can find that if you, if you dig that up. Uh, but you know, like information about using a brush and why a brush is a tool that you want to add to your, to your skill set if you're an inker or if you're trying to be an inker. Subscription, back issues. It's your career roadmap should include a side trip to small press. Yeah, they go through and list a few of the people that have taken that side trip, starting with Robert Crumb, by the way. John Byrne is another one. I'm a fan of his Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I don't know, I don't know if he left this. Well, maybe he left small press, but didn't go mainstream. I heard he ghosted Avengers. <laughs> Guide to getting motivated. Get off your butt and do the work. Um, these self-publishers, you know, the PandaCon. So you get to hear some dis distribution information that's cool it could because i wonder if there's some other pieces like there, there was an uh ninja turtles action figure I, I bet that that coasted them more than the damn comics for sure oh man yeah you might be right about that uh this is where um things kind of jump the shark for me comics for comics creators and it's like we can't help being marks like you've got to review some comics in here oh uh, i see so that's kind of funny to me but uh maybe some insight you know trying to look at them professionally Maybe in a way, some of the stuff that we look at. But uh, one of my favorite parts, Ed, Glossary of Comics Jargon. Yes, The man. kayfabe terminology for comics. WAP, WAP has that as well, man. I love it. I believe there were five different definitions for homage, homage, <laughs> swipe, homage. <laughs> TCJ gets listed, the comics journal. <laughs> Zines, fanzines, uh, newsstand distribution, copyrights, so... Yeah, I don't know about, uh, probably not the most impressive glossary of comics jargon that I've heard. I feel like one of our car rides probably has more interesting comics jargon. It's, but I love the idea that there is some uh, some attention to that. Like, this is what pros got to know this stuff. Be fluent in comics language. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's mostly other publications like AH, Amazing Heroes. Big Two. Alternative comics companies. They have APA for Amateur Press Alliance, which is uh, something that... Um, in that in that comics interview, Comics Rebels, there was a, an all professional APA that Scott McCloud started. Mm. Another thing I wouldn't mind taking a look at if somebody's at home uh, listening and has an extra copy of that they don't need laying around. But you know, submissions. Like I said, it's basically I would have loved this. Yeah. If I had this thing whenever I was twelve, thirteen, wanted to do this, this would have changed my life. And I don't know how. I'd never heard of it. I've never heard anybody mention it. I've never seen it mentioned like in the comics journal or anywhere, but uh, pretty interesting. So now I'm on the lookout for more comics career newsletters because I, I, I'm on board. I love any of this stuff of like the professional, the insider talk uh, from this time period. Yeah, that's super rad, man. What do you say we end on a on a high note? Let's do it. Cool, man. It's a big one, Jimmy. You prepared? I am. Just Might have to pull the, pull the camera back. It's huge. Check that stuff out, man. Straight from Eli Schwab, straight from Punker Mike. And there was a, uh, let's see, and uh, a ROM hacker named, named Billy Time. So what they did, Jim, they went into the original Super Mario Brothers, the one that was packed in with the yep. Nintendo Entertainment Console. Which, by the way, like, uh, you know how, like, people my age, man, it's like there's the dividing line between uh, are you Generation X or Millennial? There, it's very clear. If your Nintendo Entertainment System came with the gray zapper, Generation X. If you got That's the me. if you got the orange zapper, <laughs> you're a fucking millennial. 
So nice. there it is, man. That's the dividing line. So they went in. It's dude, Billy Time. He's, he's the ROM hacker. And they changed all of the character sprites, man, to different things. So there's like a playable Ed, playable Jim, you know, in, in place of Mario and Luigi. Uh, the mushroom is an X-Men symbol that uh, <laughs> turns you, I think, into a Ninja Turtle. <laughs> When you go into the subterranean, you know, doo 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 doo, like that area, it's mousers instead of like the beetle shells and stuff. And they said that there's probably a couple, there's like a couple dozen changes, a couple dozen hacks. I do confess that Red Room, because it's a monthly comic, had very little time for video games, man. I, I didn't take it to Bowser. Uh, but they say that. The Bowser's the character that they spent the most time on, so, so we'll reconvene and stuff. And if it's anything to do with what we're looking at right here, if they get anything close to a Frederick Wortham head on top of King yeah, that's Koopa... Amazing. That's just amazing. That'd be super amazing. I love all of the uh, the comics that are laying around here. Such great detail, because these are the tiniest... They're, they're smaller than my finger now, and it's like Dog and uh, Akira... Hip hop family tree, samurai, dragon Chang. That's Punker Mike, man. Like that's really cool. Like, like he's always so thorough that way. He's he made like that that uh, Macho Man commercial with us and stuff, and like created little comic books that that you know adorn the commercial and shit. Do not conform. Do not submit. Do not obey. I love it. This is fantastic, man. Wow, how cool, right? Are there? Could there be a cooler community than the cartoonist kayfabe community? Like, who makes this stuff? It's incredible. Well done, guys. If there is a playable ROM, Eli, Mike, Billy, like, let's get a link and yes. and, and share that with everybody so that we can spread the word of uh, cartoonist kayfabe bros. <laughs> Jim, we have the greatest audience. We certainly do. We've built we've built the the coolest community in in all of in all of comics, man. And very appreciative of all the. Uh, all the mail that's been coming through, all of the creative stuff that has been spawned since the creation of Cartoonist Kayfabe, man. It's fun to show some of this stuff off. It charges my batteries. That's right. You, you often say, Ed, you, you're ready to get back to the drawing table. Man, after this, so am I. It's very exciting to me. Yeah? Are you going to hack a ROM for Super Mario 2? <laughs> we're going we're gonna to show that off? I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm more of the uh, pen and ink style. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> me too, man. And we should get back to it. Okay, well, you know what? Before that, uh, P.O. Box 3071, uh, Monhall PA 15120, Cartoonist Kayfabe is the, is the name on top of that. Send us your your fly creations. What the fuck, man? Send us your Scott McCloud APA copies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Steve Bissett, what's up, man? <laughs> Anyhow, Kayfabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. It's out there, Jim. Join me on patreon.com slash jimrug, where you can download my zines and uh, mini comics that are hard to find out of print. You can see a lot of my original art, how I make the comics I make, all on patreon.com slash jimrug. Red Room comics are out there in the wild. I scoop them up while they're hot, man. Uh, each issue completely self-contained. You can order or pre-order them from Fantagraphics. Uh, you can read the comics before they hit paper at my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks for the archive there. Uh, more than four issues are live right now. Over 100 pages and new strips go up every Tuesday. All these links are in my link tree in the description below. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Jimmy, give them one last set of merchandise, man. We're going to be on our way. Make more comics.